Well, today we're talking with Ben Cross of Crossland Nursery, and they're based near Chichester in West Sussex. Uh, hi, Ben. How are you? Yeah, I'm very, very good. It's just warming up here in Sussex. It's been pretty dang cold, but um, I think we're just below 20 degrees outside today. So yeah, that's the warm day of uh, warmest day of early summer that we've had so far. So yeah. <laughs> Oh, you want to come up here? It's still freezing cold and pouring rain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're right. We're right on the south coast, so we're in the Brighton area. So uh, the, the channel, um, the water, the beach is five minutes behind me, and the okay. South Down National Park is five minutes ahead of me. So we're in the perfect sort of climate for for growing. The best light levels, best the uh, best soil, a nice little um, microclimate. So it's sort of cooler here in the summer with the sea breeze. Yeah. and uh, warmer here in the winter and we get protected from the southwesterlies from from the south downs so perfect location for growing yeah so you don't get any easterly winds there many no prevailing wind is southwesterly from from where we are so wow. yeah yeah so uh yeah, when we get it, from east and all that it's northeasterly but luckily we don't get that too often <laughs> yes. so what is it that you do there what are, what are you growing uh yes yeah, so we're fourth generation uh flower growers <clears throat> specializing in the British Ulstrom area so you can see a few beds uh, with me and uh, I'll give you a give you a quick tour of one of our greenhouses so if I flip flop the uh, the camera you should be able to see inside one of our greenhouses oh, so yeah. this center path here where we're walking up at the moment this used to be outside and to the left and to the right there used to be wooden greenhouses we had the big storm of 87 that blew away all of those greenhouses. So the greenhouse we're wandering through at the moment was finished uh, in 1988. And uh, when I was a little whippersnapper, uh, I was about four or five years old, slept through, through the storm like a baby, woke up the next day and my granddad gave me a bucket and I was in here picking up all the all the broken glass from the storm in, in 87. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so these, these have just got hundreds and hundreds of rows of beds of the, of the British Ulstrom area. Um, I'll try and find a hat. So for people that don't know what Ulstrom area look like. Oh yes, beautiful. That, that's what they come out and that's, that's what's with the customer. The colour's always with the customer, so it's always very, very green in here. But um, that's, that's what Ulstrom area look like. So um, yeah, it was a Swedish baron that found the seed in Chile and Peru in the mid 1700s, brought, brought it back to Europe. So it's quite a modern flower. And the uh, common name of Ulstrom area is Peruvian lily or lily of the Inca, because obviously that's where the Swedish baron Ulstrazim area uh, found the seed. So there you go. Yeah. And uh, known as a long lasting flower. So the meaning of Ulstrom area is long lasting friendship. So every flower has a meaning and the yeah. meaning of Ulstrom area is long lasting friendship. So, uh, yeah, I'm happy to give you a little a little tour of, of the nursery and um tell you about how we plant it, how we grow it, how we harvest it, talk yeah. about sort of main pests and diseases, how we combat that. Yeah. And uh, obviously mention my British Flowers Rock campaign Absolutely. at the end as well. So um, if I do that at the end, flip flop the camera, I'll show you basic setup of one of the beds. So the flower beds are about a meter wide 30 meters long and we've got hundreds and hundreds of these beds all the way through the nursery starting at the bottom the bottom of the bed here we've got our flow and return heating pipe so this is our heating pipe down where my finger is that's just our hot water and i'll talk about later how we heat that hot water yeah we've then got our low level irrigation so this is an irrigation pipe just above the soil surface and that runs the whole length 30 meters of the bed yeah and then we've got our crop supports and our netting to keep the crop and plants all tucked in and trained into the bed and then over the top here we've also got our overhead overhead irrigation as well so we water from above and from below right. and the reason the reason why we've got two types of irrigation is that i'm over six foot tall in the winter you can also see we don't have any artificial LED or sodium lighting. So that's a good thing because we don't cause any light pollution 
So yeah. what we do get through the winter months is we get seven, eight, nine foot tall stems, you know, All and right. the beds are very dense and thick with foliage. So if we were to use the overhead irrigation in the winter, all of the water and nutrients would hit the foliage, go onto the glass, algae would build up on the glass so the sun wouldn't penetrate through the glass. And more importantly, all of the nutrients and water wouldn't be getting down to the soil. So to bypass all of this tall, lush foliage in the winter, we use the low level irrigation in the winter and in the summer. So from about now until the early autumn, we'll use the overhead irrigation and that will act as like a fine mist and fine rain and yeah. you can see the crops a lot shorter now there's yeah. big gaps in the beds so the nutrient and water is gonna gonna hit the soil Brilliant. so that's why we've got two type two methods of how we water the crop basically yes so you put the nutrients in the water yep yeah. so uh british ulstermare is very sustainable obviously grown in the uk it's known as a dry crop so we only water for 20 minutes once a month in the winter so we only do about three or four waterings through the winter. Uh, in the spring, we're watering 20 minutes once every two weeks, and that only ramps up to 20 minutes once every 10 days in the summer. So our water usage is very low, it's a dry crop. And um, before the spring and before the autumn, I go around the nursery taking hundreds of core samples of the soil. That soil gets analyzed for the chemistry, for the nutrients, and we make up our feed, our fertilizer based on that analysis and that and that data and that gets fed into the water system um, and that's how we how we water and how we feed the crop yeah seems quite uh, quite scientific well it, it is yeah <laughs> i mean basically uh you're looking at high iron low iron manganese yeah. magnesium boron zinc copper the whole spectrum but me really as a ulstrum area grower and any grower really we're looking at calcium potassium and nitrogen levels so calcium uh, strength for the body and the bones, yeah. shelf life for food, yeah. so vase life for flowers. It's all to do with how long the flowers are going to last in your home in your vase. So calcium is really vital and important. Uh, yeah. Potassium makes tomatoes, goes nice, big, fat, juicy and red. Bananas nice and yellow. It makes our Ulstrom area buds nice, big, vibrant, colourful, juicy buds. So potassium is all to do with the quality of the bud. And then nitrogen is for growth stem and leaf quality. But as I say, you can have all the goodness in your soil but if your ph levels are way out then the crop's not going to take up what you want so we're as i say we're between the downs and the oceans so we get a lot of chalk runoff so people's gardens in sussex it's like being on a beach they're quite alkaline yeah, and, uh, yeah. Uh, so we we actually have to add acid into our soil to lower that ph make it more acidic so the crop and the roots can take up um what what they want really so it's a bit like us if we were having a glass of g and t or rum and coke with a straw and we're trying to suck up our drink through the straw but all this chalk and rubbish is in the way we can't actually take up what we want and um, that's a bit like the roots in the soil you know being surrounded by all that nutrient but not actually able to take it up so ph levels are vital and for ulstrum it wants to be on the more acidic side for it to take up um, what's in the soil yeah right, right. is that just specific to ulstrum areas do you think i mean obviously there's some plants no uh, a lot of things like acidic soil like blueberry bushes raspberries yeah a lot of fruits things like that there's not too many things that like a really chalky alkaline um soil so um yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, people's gardens around here, it's about the pH is about 6.6, but in our greenhouse, it's about it's about 5.6. So it's it's more of a shift towards that more acidic level. Yeah. Um, yes. So crop can take it all up. So. Uh, but yeah, so that's sort of, as I say, the basic setup of, of our beds. Uh, we've talked about the irrigation system. Um, so I can talk to you a little about about the heating. So we, yes. we heating pipes. So basically, um, so I'm fourth generation, so we started growing and going since 1936 wow. uh, as part of the Land Settlement Association, so the LSA. Uh, listeners or viewers on your YouTube channel, if you type in Land Settlement Association Siddlesham into Google, that's where our roots began. It was a yeah. government initiative, so in the 1930s there was high unemployment, we had the March to Jarrow, um, yeah. A lot of the chip builders and miners out of work. So my great grandparents were originals signing up to this land settlement association scheme. And they moved from Abertillery to Chichester down here on the south coast. Uh, my granddad then joined them after World War II. He met my nan, who was from Pompey, from Portsmouth here. 
and um, we were at Siddlesham, and then we moved here to Warburton in '57. So, oh. so we've been we've been going since 1936, and we've been been based here where I live live today since 1957. And um, when we first moved here, Granddad used to get up in the middle of the night and shovel coal oh, <laughs> into yeah. a coal fire boiler, yeah. and then we we obviously went over to oil, burning oil. Uh, oil became very expensive. Yeah. Uh, uh, but the main thing, again, for viewers and listeners to know is, yes, Ulstrom Air is a dry crop, but it's also sustainable and it's also known as a cool crop. So it looks cool in your arrangements and in your vases, but by a cool crop, we mean we don't need to heat a lot, a lot. So um, the optimum temperature in the winter through the winter nights is only 13 degrees Celsius. Right. That's a big thing. So, isn't it? so, so we don't have to do much heating. Yeah, we don't use a lot of fuel and now when we do we've come off of oil and in 2013 we've gone over to biomass oh, brilliant. Um, yeah. Yeah. so if i switch through the camera here these are the wooden pellets that we burn oh, yeah. mm -hmm. um we burn about 100 tons of these a winter uh, which is nothing compared to offices schools government buildings but we're also surrounded by slindon and goodwood estates woodland right. that has to be managed and all the managed wood it's all local wood it's all managed and it goes into these pellets and it's a lot more sustainable than burning oil and um this gives us our 13 degree um temperature in the greenhouses at night which is perfect so um this year we've burnt about 130 tons of these because um it's been colder we had frost we had frosts and snow in april down here which is yeah. unheard of you know but um yeah. so these are the bad boys these are little these are little pellets that we burn to heat the water that's in our that's in our pipe work so that's excellent and it doesn't come you know it's not going back it's not coming from very far either is it so the the car the, no the about 10 the minutes down the road the um mm. the, the wood, woods from and um yeah. yeah it's a lot more sustainable so the government actually have an they used to, they, they stopped it this year, but it was an in initiative called the Renewable Heat Incentive. Yes. So yes. Uh, what we burn, the government gives us a bit of money back, which is, mm. uh, it's uh, unheard of really that growers get any help. So yeah. it's nice to get a little <laughs> bit of, uh, yeah. nice to get a little bit of help. So um, yeah, we've got sustainable heating for the next 20 years. So um, yeah, that's great. And because what the problem with burning oil is that, because it was getting so expensive, instead of heating at 13 degrees, we were heating the Ulstrom area at five degrees at night. And oh, heating right. the crop at five degrees is like putting an invisible magical fleece over the crop saying, well, you know, you're not going to get frosted, but you're not going to be very productive. You're going to get botrytis, yellow leafing, not going to be very nice for us to work in here. And um Christmas, Valentine's, Mother's Day and Easter are all in our winter time. Yeah, and that's what yeah. guys at home uh, yeah. want flowers. So um, big, big problems with, with heating at lower temperatures. So uh, burning these, uh, we're back up, we're back up running at 13 degrees. If you heat the crop beyond 13 degrees, sort of 16, 17 degrees, you're going to get a lot of soft, tall, ungainly growth. Um, nice. So you don't want to heat it too much. But yeah, so there you go. That's... Um, Brilliant. That's how, that's how we heat the crop. Excellent. All right. So really I can really talk, to, talk to you guys about um, how we harvest the crop and a bit yes. of crop maintenance, yeah. how we keep the plants nice and healthy. Um, never, ever call Ulstrom area a cut flower again in your life. <laughs> Not a cut flower. It's a hand-picked flower. So I'm going to show you guys now if I get in here. This is a Whistler, which is a lovely... A lovely white variety and all we're going to do we're going to get our hands in here and we're just going to pick the stem straight out off the root off the soil so i will demonstrate again we're very busy at the moment you can see all of the buds budding up on this bed yes so we're very busy at the moment we're doing tens of thousands of stems a week at the moment and we right. do millions of stems through the course of the year but i'll just keep showing you so you're just pulling them just pulling them straight off, straight out of the ground, like root. Some people call it a bit like picking rhubarb. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. here I go one last time. There you go. There's the third one. So. So what happens then if you if you just if you you know went there with a pair, pair of secateurs or scissors and cut them? What does that yeah. harm the plant? Yeah. So the biggest 
thing is that all stromeria, it's not what you call a one hit wonder. It's not a seed or a bulb that you put in the ground, it grows, you cut it next year, you've got to put another seed, another bulb in. All of these beds uh, are behind me. They're a maze of rhizomes, tubers and root systems. And they've been here for 20, 30 years and you need to wow. treat the surface of those roots like your carpet in your lounge at home. You want to hoover it up and keep it nice and tidy. So if you can imagine my fist is the root under the soil and you've cut all your stems, you're left with all these old cuttings. They go brown, rot, decay, go back onto the root and they stop and, and they inhibit further growth. Whereas if you pick all of the stems, you're tidying up the surface of that rhizome, stimulating more growth. You're going to have a healthier root, healthier flowers and happier customers. So yeah, always pick your Ulstromeria, never never cut it. Okay. So. All right, yeah. now, how long do the plants live? Do they live a lot? You said some of those are 20, 30 years old. Do they yeah. live for longer than that? Yeah, so another sustainability thing. We said it's a dry crop, doesn't take a lot of water. Oh. It's a cool crop, doesn't take a lot of heat. Uh, it's also sustainable in the fact that we only replant less than 5% of the crop a year. So we've got hundreds of these beds yeah. behind me but we, we've only got three beds scheduled for replanting this year right. in 2021. So um, yeah, a lot of these varieties, we do a smorgasbord, a plethora of varieties. We do over 70, 70 varieties, I think 79 varieties. Wow. And we have a full color range all year round. Yeah, and, um, yeah less than 5% of the crop is replanted and some varieties um, you can't even buy anymore. They're 20, 30 years old and uh, you can't even buy them anymore and they're still they're still really good so we've been doing it for so long that we know what varieties cope best with the british weather and yeah. we know know how to look after them so um and how do you replace the plants because i think i don't think you can propagate them can you no so we pay uh breeders rights or license agreements so it would be illegal for me to divide my roots and sell them on. So a bit like a TV license or road tax every year that these plants are in our soil, we have to pay a license. So um, I was going to talk about it later, but it's quite handy to talk about it now before we get into any crop maintenance or how we look after the plants. So yes. the plants come to us in these little nine centimetre pots right. with the tuber, the tuber, the rhizome with a bit of soil and a bit of plant material coming out the top here. Yes. And 135 of these little dudes go into one of our beds. So 135 plants into one of our beds. And it's over 1500 pounds to replant one of our beds. And then every year we also have to pay an annual license as well. So very specialist. Uh, these are obviously commercial varieties, not your garden varieties. But um, yeah, very specialist, very expensive. Um, we usually uh, we plant these in the ground at the end of August. And you might be wondering, Ben, why don't you plant them before the spring and then they come into action quicker? <laughs> well, if we put these in the ground in uh, February or March time, they're going to grow too rapidly. You come to pick one of those stems like I've just shown you and the whole root comes out of the ground because the root hasn't had time yeah. to establish and mature. Yeah. Whereas if we put these little baby plants in in August, it's got all of the autumn, all of the winter, all of that early spring we've had. So when we're picking hundreds of stems off of these a day at the moment, we're not pulling up chunks of root and things like that. They're really well established and they're really mature. And another thing is what's the point in rushing the growth because yeah. this variety the one we've just picked here, it's going to be in here for another 20 years so yeah, exactly. we'd That's rather right. get the, the, the plants and the roots really mature and really growing vigorously and happy before we start you know harvesting shed loads off of them so um yeah so that's how we plant and what we plant and how much it is how much it is to plant so um yeah just as well they last uh 20 or 30 yeah. years <laughs> Yeah, and, and basically, if you look after them, they look after you. So um, harvesting the crops, so picking the flowers is that much of the whole job. There's so yeah. much more to do in, in looking after the plants. So if I quickly show you, everything's looking really, um, really good in here at the moment. So if I flip flop the camera. So you can see here, we've got our crop supports and our netting, and you can see we've got two stems here that are sort of invading and encroaching out into the path. And we call this tucking in, tucking them back in, back into the wire netting like this. Right. So we've tucked those two stems back in. Um, if we've got staff walking down here, they won't bend and break the stems. We're using the overhead irrigation. So as we water, if those stems were still popping up at the side here, 
they would break with the weight of the water coming from above. So tucking them in, it keeps them nice and regiment back into the bed, nice straight stems, and it protects them and, and keeps them growing nicely. So that's one job, tucking in, tucking in all of the stems that are encroaching out into the path, tucking them back into the bed so you can see a nice, clear, clear path. So that's one job. Another job is more of a winter job, but with the poor light levels through the winter, we get a lot of blind growth. So we get lovely, lovely stem quality and lovely foliage through the winter, but we get a lot of stems where there's no sign of bud or the buds have aborted and gone brown. Um, so I will try and find a stem like that. Ah, here we go. So we've got lovely stem, lovely foliage, but you can see no actual sign of any bud. Yeah. And this needs to be thinned out. So we call this thinning out, thinning out all of the blind growth in the bed. So there's another couple of stems down here that I'm going to take away and thin out and get rid of. So what I'm doing here, I'm allowing light back into the bed. And basically those stems that were never, ever going to produce any flower, they were taking up valuable energy and resource from the soil. So I've got rid of those. I've put energy back into these roots, lights going back into the bed. There's more room for the nutrients to get into it and more chance of stems popping up um, with, with buds on like, like these stems. So that's called thinning. And then the last job that everyone's familiar with is weeding and we don't spray our weeds we do a lot of hair all of our weeds are hand weeded and um what you want to do when you're weeding is make sure you obviously take out take out the the roots of the weed like this one and what you want to do with your weed is just put it back on top of the soil and all of the goodness in the weed like it's it's full of iron and potassium and, and calcium you want to let that rot back into the soil and as you leave the weeds on top of the soil you're inhibiting and stopping further weeds from growing back. So um, you never want to take the weeds out your garden. You just want to make sure you, you get the root out, put it back on top of your soil and uh, happy days. So that's the... Um, what, what do you do with the, um, uh, the... I can't remember what you called it now. Where are you taking out? Thinning out. The, the grow, yeah, the thinning out. What do you do with those? Stems? Yep. So basically it's called a uh, greenhouse or glasshouse hygiene. You don't want to leave any rotting matter uh, in our paths. So all of the old stems that are cut and all of that thinned out growth that's taken out of the greenhouse. Um, yeah. If if you leave rotting plant matter, you're going to attract bug, bugs and insects and other things. So you want to yeah. get that, get that out. Um, but as I say, through the British Flowers Rock campaign, the war on waste, uh, we're now educating florists to use, you know, we discard hundreds and hundreds of tons of foliage a winter. And yeah. what do people want in winter for their Christmas wreaths? harvest festivals, decorations, they want foliage. So we're, yeah. we're educating people to use that foliage um, because it's free and it's uh, helping the war on waste. So, but as I say, they're the, the four types of crop maintenance that we do on a daily basis, some more than others, depending on the, on the time of the yeah. year. So obviously yeah. in spring and autumn, we're, we're picking more. Um, in the winter, we're do, doing more of that thinning out before the spring and before the autumn when they're growing quite vigorously that's when we do all of that tucking in yeah. and more more weeding in the summer because if you look behind me we're in sort of early summer now and um the austrum air it's like a weed <laughs> it's taking up all available soil space behind me so the sun actually isn't penetrating the soil so we don't get many weeds so most of our weeding done is is done in the summer months because that's sort of our low production because yeah. in the summer the soil temperature warms up to about 30 odd degrees and the roots of the ulstrom area in the soil they kind of want to do what we want to do go to the beach chill out have an ice cream and they basically go into a period of dormancy so they they trap in all available moisture so they they sort of shut down and, and sort of chill out so we harvest more than they can regenerate in the summer so production tails off in the summer and then they come back quite happy again in the autumn so uh yeah but yeah have you got any questions mary about sort of other things how we look after the plants yeah so what about pests and diseases how do you manage uh, those uh, you're on my wavelength so that's exactly <laughs> where we're going now i've got a few examples of biocontrol so we don't wow. use any pesticides or insecticides we're using biocontrol we're using biology to kill biology that we don't want here yeah so yeah. um i've got um two good examples so i'm just gonna flip flop the camera again 
so this is an Incasia card, so uh, made by Bioline. And where my, bear with me, where my thumb is, this small little circle here, yeah. the Incasia, this is the predator of white fly. So Incasia oh. look like a big ant with fangs on, under a microscope. They're not like <laughs> roaming around here. Um, but they, they, they come on these cards. They live in these little this little circle. You'll hang this card up where you've got a problem with white fly. And these will, these will walk off of the card and these guys will hunt down the white fly. Um, you can also use these cards in conjunction with banker plants or companion plants. So you can see oh. I've got my tomato plants growing quite happily here. Oh, what yeah. I'll do is I'll, I'll put these Incasia cards around the tomato plants. I'll build up a really good population of Incasia. And naturally, the white fly will be attracted off of the crop onto your banker plants or companion plants and the white fly just keep getting eaten by the incarsia. You can use um, eggplants or aubergine plants. Uh, you can use cucumber plants, courgette plants. You can hang these up around those plants. And uh, yeah, you've got yourself a Venus fly trap for, for white fly. So, um, Brilliant. so there you go. And you, you can buy these cards online from, yeah. from buyers. So yeah. uh, a, a little plug, a little plug for them. <laughs> so, there you go. So that's that's how we deal with with white fly. Yeah. Um, we also get a problem with the two spotted, the red spider mite. Oh, um, yes. yeah. It's a, a mid to late summer problem for most gardeners and, mm. and most people who have greenhouses. It gets so hot that the spider might work their way at what way out of all the nooks, crannies and crevices of the greenhouse structure. Yeah. And the first thing they'll do is, is live on your weed. Uh, because we do hand weeding, we don't spray our weeds, we do our hand weeding, uh, they'll move off of the weed and they'll move onto your crop or whatever you're growing. And the spider mite, they basically suppress depressed growth, basically. And uh, the way we spot that, it, it's like someone sprinkled pepper on the underside of the leaf. Yeah. That's how you can spot them. And um, to combat that, we use a vial of phytocelis. So there's nothing yeah. in here, an old vial, but yeah. phytocelis... Uh, it's another spider mite. It's about twice the size of the red <coughs> spider. And uh, these guys, you just sprinkle this over your affected area. And these guys will hunt down and chomp away and feast and gorge their way through the uh, spider mite. And then these guys, once they've done eating on all the spider mite, they'll eat themselves. Well, so these guys, <laughs> these guys won't affect they won't affect the crop because they'll end up eating themselves to death. So, But that's um, phytocelis. So we've got our encarsia for the white fly, our phytocelis for the two spotted spider mite. And then a really easy gardening hack for anyone is to get the yellow uh, sticky traps. So oh, yes. I've, got, yeah. I've got one set up by the tomato plants. So, Oh yeah, I can see that. Yeah, they're really, really good, aren't they? Yeah, and they're really, um, you can see a white fly flying around. Well, you might not talk on the camera, but there's a white fly flying around here. Um, so what happens is a, a really quick um, hack tip and trick for using these is they come they come two-sided, and what you want to do is peel off one side first, use up one side before then peeling off the second bit of tape and using the second side. You'll basically prolong the lifespan of your yellow yellow sticky trap. Oh. Um, we usually use these mainly for leaf hopper. So um, between March and Christmas, we harvest the crop seven days a week, but between Christmas and Valentine's Day, um, we're only harvesting like three days a week. So the crops sat here a bit longer. And what we tend to get, instead of having a nice green leaf, you'll get these white, white chains of bleaching on your leaf. And that'll be the leaf hopper sucking out the goodness of your leaf. They're kind of like the vampires of the gardening world. They, oh they suck the goodness out of your leaf. Yeah. So to combat that, we use the yellow sticky traps. The adult leaf hoppers stick to the trap. You stop the life cycle. So you're back to having a nice nice green leaf so um yeah there you go so that that's how we sort of combat them really so yeah yeah, yeah excellent and what um do you have trouble with with fungi with botrytis and or do you manage to keep that at bay uh we don't have any botrytis because uh we're heating properly so okay. because our because our pipe work i don't think i said earlier but because our because our pipe work is down here yeah. It's getting a nice dry atmosphere down by the root system. And then as the heat rises off of this pipework, it dries off the condensation and dampness that you may get on plants in a greenhouse. So yeah. that's why our heating 
is is low level and down by the by the root system um so that's uh that's how you want to heat basically you whenever you're heating anything you want to heat from from down by the root system by the soil yeah yeah yeah, yeah. a lot of people have these hot air blowers which are mm -hmm. sort of above your head or or up here and you're just wasting the heat and you're yeah. still going to get botrytis and dampness and and condensation building up on your plants and your yeah. greenhouse and that's exactly what you say that's where you get your, your botrytis yes. from hmm. that's so that, um, you know. that's mainly about the pestilence we get a little bit of black fly in the early autumn right uh, but it's usually only on about five stems out of five thousand stems so we yeah. usually <laughs> crunch those up yes. in our hands and throw them away yeah. um, do, do you have the windows open during the summer do you get thing insects coming yeah. outside uh well obviously bir bir birds yes. can bring in pests and diseases and all sorts of things but yeah, yeah. so for example now we're in may our, our vents in the greenhouse they're open today right. Uh, right. about 20 odd degrees in here yeah yeah so it's an overcast day which is actually good for filming and talking yes. to you a nice day <laughs> uh, the sun's not sort of glaring into my phone or into my face but um yeah so um yeah we we vent all the time yeah okay. then they're, they're not on um they're not on autom automation because what happens if it's on on automatic the vent gear gets worn out pretty quickly oh, so right. we, we just use my growers initiative and yeah up, up, up in the morning down at night otherwise <laughs> if you're going like that all the time in the day you're wearing out your your vent gear and you're going to get damaged so um yes, yes. yeah so once you, once you pick the flowers once you pick the flowering stems what happens to them then I tell you what, Mary, we're on the same wave today. Yeah. Everything's going well. I've got good signal. I'm literally just heading over to where I've got a couple of pre pre bunched flowers. Excellent. Already done. So I'm gonna have to flip flop the camera here. So this is our this is our premium bunch. So this is um, Whistler, which is yeah, a nice nice white variety. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how they arrive in your home, like that. Yeah. And the, the 90, 90 centimeter long, five chunky stems in our premium grade. And this is what florists would use for big, expensive bouquets, um, big flower arranging, pedestal work, and things like that. So that's our top, 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 top grade. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of, again, viewers and listeners, they've all probably heard of um, of the War on Waste, the Hugh Fernley yeah. Whittingstall campaigns so everyone's heard of the wonky veg or ugly veg yes. a lot of parsnips being thrown away yeah. and uh, things like that what it everything like that applies with flowers as well so supermarkets and wholesalers have specifications so we discard tens and tens of thousands of stems a year because they don't come up to supermarket specifications so uh, we also have as well as our top grade we have a posy grade which is my version or our version of the wonky veg so they're wonky flowers so yeah. i'll show you the bunch here okay so this is sylvan which is a lovely pink variety exactly the same exactly the same quality of flower as on the last bunch i showed you yes. but these are 60 centimeters so still tall enough to whack in your vases at yeah. home yeah. um so they're 60 centimeters there's eight to 10 stems in a bunch. And because they're a little bit gnarly at the bottom, they're a bit wonky and they don't weigh 22.1 grams each and they're not perfectly straight. This bunch of flowers in my hand at the moment would be rejected by a supermarket or a wholesaler. But we sell these through the post. So for 20 pounds, you get four of these big bunches delivered direct to your door, including delivery for 20 quid four of these bunches and uh, people love them. They're just nice big bunches of flowers and um, they last two or three weeks in your home. So yeah. this is my version of the wonky veg, our posy grade, which again, a lot of florists will use for floral crowns, buttonholes, little jam jars, uh, or just for selling outside a shop, you know, sustainably Sussex grown Alstrom area, two bunches yeah. for a fiver outside your shop. Beautiful. Um, so that's our, our two different grades. The, the premium grade there, and the uh, the wonky flowers here, you can't really tell the difference really on on camera because it's all down to weight and little niggly bits that people look at in offices. You know, they don't understand. It's a natural, a natural thing. So um, yeah, so that that's what they look like basically. And um, 
yeah, I can run through, say, the big, the big differences with these. You pick, you pick up a bunch of flowers in most shops. What have they attached to the bunch of flowers down here, Mary, usually? Oh, that little plastic bag of fertilizer. You've already, you've already said the P word. Yeah. yeah. Plastic. Right. So usually there's a plastic bit of sellotape, a plastic sachet with the yeah. rubbish, rubbishy, chemically flower food. And you don't need any of that with these. They're, they're nice, green and fleshy on the end. They're not like cardboard. You don't need any extra flower food or packaging. All of our packaging is made out of recycled plastics and it is right. recyclable. Yes. And then um, obviously it takes about five weeks for flowers to sort of go around the world before they get into the UK into your houses so what they tend to do is spray the buds leaves and stems with chemicals and they also line the packaging they line the packaging with more chemicals yeah. to stop the buds opening in transit but after our flowers are picked we there's there's no chemicals on our packaging and there's no chemicals on our flowers and there's no um flower food sachet and uh, people that collect direct from the nursery uh, they collect the raw products, so they don't have any packaging at all. So yeah. big, big differences with buying my flowers compared to um, Ulstrom area in, in the shops and things. So, um, yeah. Yes, but it, it isn't just um, all of that from, uh, you know, a sustainability point of view and the, the fact that, you, you know, you haven't got the chemicals on there. Um, I, I think a lot of people probably don't realise just how many chem chemicals there are on, on flowers that they're buying. Um, but it's also the, the, the actual quality of the flowers. They look a lot better than what you would buy in the uh, supermarket, unless it's one of yours. I mean, they just look yeah. bigger and fatter and just better flowers. Yeah, so I, I didn't really mention it earlier, um, but I can mention it now. So basically, when, when we, you know, we were picking the, the white variety earlier on. Yes. Yeah. I've got the same variety here. And the oh. big difference, the big difference with me, with us, is that you can see these nice, big, fat, elongated buds. Yes. And that, that's how we harvest. We harvest them at what I, I call a ripe bud stage, a ripe bud stage. It's a bit like going strawberry picking. You don't want those little yellow green strawberries. You want those mm -hmm. nice, big, fat red strawberries. You want those nice, big, fat red tomatoes, not those orangey ones from Holland, you know. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. But it's the same with flowers. You want those nice, big, fat, elongated buds. So that's how we how we harvest them. So we'll have this one, and it's a beautiful, beautiful, yeah. elongated buds. But if we were in, um, you know, Ecuador, Ethiopia, Kenya, we'd be picking these tiny, tiny little white buds so we could fit more in a shipping container, more in an aeroplane. And if you pick them this tight, they may hardly ever open up in your house or in the shop. So if I if I get the, the stem that we've just picked and put it alongside it, hang on a second. So again, you can see the difference. Nice big fat buds, yeah. tiny little buds. So when we harvest them at this stage, they're going to give you a bigger, more vibrant flower head. And they're still going to last just as long if yeah. not longer so if you pick this it will last two or three weeks if you pick that it will last two or three weeks but these tiny little buds they'll never actually explode into an explosion of color you know you yeah. won't hardly get any flower power from that whereas these yeah. they've got more power and and stuff's um you know stored in their buds so yeah. that's how yeah. we how we harvest so um they like when yeah. you get these rose buds particularly around valentine's day they never open up do they they just stay like they are yeah, so the thing with other flowers, because of all the chemicals, the roses won't have any scent. They'll stay tight in bud and go brown and die. Yeah. Big lid, they like big brown bananas. They'll hardly ever, never open up any scents because they're picked too tight. And all stromeria, they look like fragile, pale, faded out little buds. It's because yeah. they're five weeks old and they've been flown and shipped around the world on boats. So, um, yeah, big, big differences. So, um, yeah. But say so any, any questions about... Um, sort of the processing or anything i mean we, we kind of went through it all there i don't know what time we're on yes so i'm yeah, happy to talk about the campaign to finish off the talk yeah, definitely yeah and also then how people can get hold of your uh areas. yeah no worries <laughs> so um we've obviously spoken about the big differences with imported flowers and british flowers and yes i actually did marine biology from 2000 to 2011 i came <laughs> back here in 2011 and from 2011 to 2014 i tried to get help from the nfu from defra from government 
from the local MP here in the South Down region, and no one was bothered. Everyone was quite happy that we're importing over 90% of flowers and all this carbon footprint and uh, road miles and air miles and all of that. So in 2014, I, I gave up trying to get help and started my British Flowers Rock campaign, which we're wearing on the T-shirt here. Yeah. And that's all about doing talks and podcasts and things with you guys with my garden, just, just like you. So I, I really appreciate you interviewing me and having me on and promoting the campaign and the Ulstrom area because, as I say, over 90% is imported. And as I say, the, the carbon footprint that that's producing, the environmental impacts of that is, is just redonkulous, you know. Oh, so, crazy. and we're not we're not just talking about supermarkets. We're talking about uh, letterbox companies, uh, supermarkets, yes. uh, garage forecourts, you know, gas stations, yes. florists, farm shops import flowers, and even cafes and restaurants that may have a locally sourced food menu, but the flowers on their table have come from miles away. So mm -hmm. it's all about just next time you ever see a flower out and about, just think twice about you know where that flowers come from just like you would your food or even beauty products beauty products with the parabens in or yeah. or um, slow fashion so a lot of um, fashion now is more eco-conscious and obviously now which being urged to buy electric cars and things so yeah. it's um the flower industry is a 2.2 billion pound industry and we never get the recognition for for how much is imported and what more needs to be done. So that's what the British Flowers Rock campaign is all about, just raising that awareness, raising that education. Yeah. Um, it, almost, you... it almost feels a bit as though it's pushed under the carpet. We don't want to know about it. Yeah, like, like we've talked about today, we've covered everything from sustainability with the heating and the watering. We've talked about the wonky flowers. We've yeah. talked about plastic packaging and the yeah. packaging chemicals and the air miles we've talked about everything that Hugh Fernie and Jamie Oliver and Jimmy talk about with the food and all sorts of things so um yeah it deserves more more airtime and, and no one's really bothered apart from me so I'm just trying to trying to get it out there so I really yes. appreciate you um give me yes. the platform and if people want to find out more um if you type in Crosslands Flower Nursery to Facebook we're on there and I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Ulstrom Area Ben so yeah. I'm sure you'll put it in your link. In I your will. YouTube. I'll put it in, in the show notes. Um, yeah, and uh, my email and my contact details are on there. So if you want the £20 sort of delivery to your home, you just email me or, or call me. Uh, we don't have a website, but all my contact details are on social media. You can message me or whatever. So, um, yeah, I really appreciate you uh, doing Thanks the call. Much. and. Yeah. I've given you a virtual tour of one of our greenhouses. Yeah, so, uh, it's absolute pleasure, Ben. It really is because it's such an important. Uh, it is such an important subject, and it definitely needs far, far more. Oh, you've disappeared, Ben. It's all right, I'm back. I'm <laughs> yeah, back. Right. you know, it definitely needs far more um, advertising and awareness. And just one simple thing that people can do is when now that we're able to start going out for meals, or we'll be able to soon we can be asking the uh, um, the restaurant or the hotel or wherever it is that we're going, saying, well, where have you got your flowers from? Why haven't yep. you bought local ones? Don't you realise that those flowers are full of chemicals or, you know, think about the air miles and everything else that's been involved in producing them. And, yeah. you know, we, we'd like, why don't you put it on your uh, menu that you're using yeah. sustainable? There's actually a few... There's a few restaurants here in Brighton that have our flowers and they they promote they promote that yeah. as well as their food because sure. th their customers are getting the full experience of yes. you know, what's the worst thing sitting down with locally sourced food but the flowers come from Ethiopia or Kenya you know yeah, and exactly. that, that's got as much carbon footprint as if you imported some you know New Zealand lamb or something so exactly. Uh, exactly. So, yeah, there, there is more of awareness and it's just about getting out there. I mean, I've been doing my campaign since 2014 and what we're halfway through 2021 and people are still, you know, interested in the subject and still getting talked about and things like that. So um, it proves that people are bothered by it and they're interested in it and yeah, um, yeah. We, we keep on keep on going with it. So it's great. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Well, I wish you all the best then. I mean, it's been an absolutely fascinating talk. Been wonderful to see inside, actually see inside the glass houses. So um, people will be able to go over to YouTube and, and see the video on there as well. Um, yep. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's just opened my eyes to uh, 
something I had no idea <laughs> went on at all. But you don't, you see, unless you actually see it. And here about yeah. it, you don't know how these things are done. So, so thank you, Ben. That's all right. No worries. <laughs>